recent that we saw Mario Yamasaki's is a pretty bad stoppage. Are you happy with this call? Are you, are you, right now, how you feeling? Mario Yamasaki, he takes a lot of bull And I never want to see him rapping ever again. He, he makes me sick. Despite his famous and endearing heart-shaped hands, Mario Masaki is one of the most hated referees in the history of the UFC. Over the course of his career, he has officiated some of the sport's most high-profile fights, and time after time, Mario found himself at the center of controversy. Mario has officiated over 400 fights across Strike Force, the WEC, Elite XC, Pride FC, and of course the UFC. And for most of his career, he was actually considered a decent official. We're here with one of the most respected referees in the game in the UFC, Mario Masaki. But there are nine key fights that over a 13-year span dissolved Mario's reputation from a credentialed referee to an incompetent oversight. I'm not that bad, you know. He is so notorious in the MMA community that he's spawned a plethora of memes. And in my own YouTube videos, I've seen countless hilarious Mario Yamasaki nicknames. So let's dissect who Mario Yamasaki is, the fights that soiled his career, and if Mario actually deserves to be the most hated UFC referee. Mario Yamasaki was born in 1964 in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and grew up in a martial arts family. His half-Japanese father, Shigeru Yamasaki, was an 8th degree judo red and white belt and passed along his martial arts teachings to Mario and his brother Fernando. Mario fell in love with the art of grappling, but in 1986, at age 22, transitioned to training in Brazilian jiu-jitsu under several black belts and skilled grapplers, including his own brother Fernando. With such deep roots in martial arts, it was only natural that Mario became aware of the UFC in the early and late 1990s, where grappling arts dominated the early UFC. UFC tournaments. Mario was fascinated with the UFC's events and saw an opportunity to assist the UFC in organizing the first event in Brazil, which is now known as UFC 17 and a half, aka UFC Brazil Ultimate Brazil in 1998. It was an exciting event, highlighting Brazil's rising talent. You may even remember Vitor Belfort's rushing knockout over Vanderlei Silva. And after the event going off without a hitch, Mario approached legendary referee Big John McCarthy for a referee's position within the promotion. And I said, John, you know, why are you the only referee in UFC? What about if you get sick or you either get hurt? And with the sport growing and needing more referees, Yamasaki was brought on for his first event at UFC 20 the following year. U.S. appearance inside the octagon. Once again, our alternate referee, Mario Yamasaki. And John let me, you know, referee the, the first fights, the preliminary. Little did Big John or the UFC know the string of bad calls to follow. To be fair to Yamasaki, his first real blunder wouldn't come until UFC 52, a full 6 years and 44 fights officiated later. And some of his major mistakes happened years apart, with many fights in between them where he didn't do anything wrong. But the issue is that some of these calls, stoppages, and mistakes were so bad that they almost derailed the legacies of great fighters, case in point UFC 52. On April 16th, 2005, Matt Hughes faced Frank Trigg in a highly anticipated rematch. Their first fight was Matt Hughes' fifth welterweight title defense, where Matt Hughes secured a spectacular standing rear naked choke to defeat Trigg in round one. And Matt Hughes did not think he could top that performance. But Mario Yamasaki certainly spiced things up a bit. Less than 60 seconds into round one, Frank Trigg landed a clear as day groin strike on Matt Hughes, and Mario Yamasaki completely missed it. I mean, uh, Matt looked to help from the referee, but Mario Yamasaki didn't see the, the groin strike. And while trying to signal the foul to Yamasaki, Trigg continued to attack Hughes and nearly finished the champion with ground and pound. He got hit in the groin, looked to referee Mario Yamasaki. Mario Yamasaki didn't stop it. Frank Trigg took advantage of it. Wow! And now Frank Trigg in a good position. Even the commentary team could not believe what was happening. But it gets worse, because while trying to recover from the foul and the strikes that followed, Frank Trigg took Hughes back and nearly finished him with a rear naked choke. But Matthews escaped the onslaught, slammed Frank Trigg across the cage, took his back, and submitted Trigg with a short choke to retain his title. And while this is an inspiring comeback, the fight should have been stopped the moment the foul took place. Yes, Mario missed it, but it was his duty as the official to position himself so that he doesn't miss blatant fouls in legacy-defining title fights such as these. The fight is now in the Hall of Fame and Dana White's favorite UFC fight ever, but we can't let that overshadow the fact that Yamasaki almost took a Hall of Fame career off course because of an unseen low blow. But let's take a turn into a more bizarre call Mario made at UFC 70. Alessio Sakara faced Victor Valamaki on April 21st, 2007. And in just under two minutes into the fight, Sakara lands a beautiful right hand that stunned Valamaki, and Mario Yamasaki jumped in between them to presumably stop the fight. But to the confusion of the fans, Sakara, and the commentary team, Mario called a timeout because Valamaki's mouthpiece fell out during the exchange. 
Thankfully, as soon as the fight resumed, Sakara picked up right where he left off to essentially earn two TKO victories in one night. I can understand why Mario made this call, as part of prioritizing fighters' safety is ensuring they have their mouthpiece. But it is not standard to pause a potentially fight-ending exchange just for a mouthpiece. A referee usually waits for a break in the action to retrieve and put in a fighter's fallen mouth guard. And while the last two Yamasaki mistakes ended with the right fighter winning, we can't say that for this next bout. At UFC 142 in January 2012, Eric Silva met Carlo Prater for a welterweight showdown between two skilled grapplers. And just seconds into the opening round, Eric Silva landed a beautiful knee that wobbled Prater and allowed Silva to follow it up with swift and powerful shots. The speed and explosiveness of Silva is something that Prater's got to look out for, and he got caught! Giving Yamasaki no choice but to step in and call the fight. That should have been the end of the story, but as Eric Silva was happily awaiting the official reading of the decision, Mario Yamasaki decided to rule the fight a disqualification loss for Silva due to illegal punches to the back of the head. And Carlo, you can see the strain on his face. He was trying to, to cover up and take... Those are illegal shots too, Mike. All to the side of the head, yep. none of them to the back of the head. But Joe Rogan wasn't having any of it. Let's take a look at it, Eric, because it, look, it looked legal to me. Nearly every shot that landed was to the side of the head. These look like legal shots to me. This prompted Joe to interrogate Yamasaki on the spot. Are you happy with this call? Are you, are you right now, how are you feeling about this? And Yamasaki did not seem confident in his decision. That doesn't look like the back of the head to me, man. That's not the back of the head? It was an awful fiasco, and Mario immediately seemed to regret his decision. You know, I have to decide here right now. But Mario's poor decision making here left a permanent disqualification loss on Eric Silva's record. However, Yamasaki's assignment in October of that same year is perhaps an even more grossly incompetent stain on his career. On October 13, 2012, Glover Teixeira met Fabio Maldonado at UFC 153 in what almost immediately became a one-sided beatdown. Glover Teixeira quickly hurt and mounted Maldonado and began to rain down heavy ground and pound. Big left hook! He's a big trouble. Fabio's down! Trying to finish it right here! Maldonado was taking so many unanswered elbows and punishment that the commentary team continuously thought Yamasaki would step in. Mario Yamasaki can stop this fight anytime he wants. Yamasaki looking at him very carefully. But amazingly, they made it to the next round where Glover rained down more of the same damage onto Fabio. And upon the conclusion of the second round, Fabio's battered face was observed by the cage side doctor who deemed him unfit to continue. The, the doctor's stopping the fight. That's it. The doctor's stopping the fight. Mario's priority as a referee should be fighter safety, and I can understand wanting to allow Fabio every opportunity to compete. But he was getting dominated with Glover landing 117 shots to Fabio's 14 with little signs of intelligent defense. And damage like this can not only alter a fighter's career but affect their mental well-being. Thankfully, it would be another four years before Mario had another incident, but he made up for it by having two in the same night. On February 21st, 2016, Cody Garbrandt met Agosto Mendez. And four minutes into the first round, Cody Garbrandt landed a furious combination, dropping Mendez who was clearly out of it. And Yamasaki awkwardly stepped in between the fighters but didn't stop the fight. And confusingly, let Garbrandt land a few more shots to essentially finish Agosto twice. It's not the worst stoppage we've ever seen as even more respected officials have had worse judgment on a given night. But when we're looking at Yamasaki's body of work, we can't ignore this moment and even less what occurred later. In the main event that night, Donald Cowboy Cerrone met Alex Cowboy Oliveira and Cerrone pretty quickly took down Oliveira and locked up a tight triangle choke. But Yamasaki confusingly did not see Oliveira profusely tapping to the submission, waiting until Cerrone signaled the tap to save Oliveira from unnecessarily going unconscious. It's particularly strange because as a BJJ black belt, Yamasaki's attention should have been on Oliveira to see if he was going to tap or go unconscious. Perhaps Yamasaki was distracted from thinking about his blunder from earlier, but letting a fighter nearly go to sleep when they've already surrendered could have led to a medical suspension for Oliveira or even worse. Dana White made his opinion on the matter very clear on Twitter. But even though Oliveira didn't take unnecessary damage, we can't say the same for Travis Brown. On February 19, 2017, Derek Lewis met Travis Brown for a heavyweight main event, where in round two, Derek Lewis connected with a devastating right hand. The fight probably could have ended there, but while Yamasaki was screaming defend yourself to Travis Brown, he took several unanswered shots to put him completely unconscious. Derek Lewis actually thanked Mario Yamasaki in the post-fight press conference. 
No, I appreciate it. I, I, well, yeah, if I give him a thousand dollars. I appreciate it for letting the fight go a little longer than what it was. Because I just wanted to get all my anger out on Travis' face anyway, because he liked to hit on women. So I appreciate him for doing that. Yamasaki, however, acknowledged that he was a little too late, saying I should have stopped it a little earlier. But just four months later, he took early stoppage a bit too seriously. Kevin Lee faced Michael Chiesa on June 25th, 2017. The two had bad blood leading into their fight, which made it a highly anticipated bout for fans. But unfortunately, their fight would end in controversy. With less than 30 seconds left in round one, Kevin Lee secured a tight short choke on Michael Chiesa. And without tapping to the choke, Yamasaki separated the fighters to grant Kevin Lee a submission victory. I know that Kiesa didn't seem to be defending the choke, but with 26 seconds left in the fight, Kevin Lee's arms could have gassed out, Kiesa could have readjusted, or Kiesa could have just passed out. I agree that it didn't look good for Kiesa, but under the surface, he was defending. I fight the hands when he's going RNC, switches palm to palm, shrink your shoulders in, flex your neck, get your elbows in. When he loosens up, you elbow down, turn in. I saw it was short time on the clock. I went to what I know, and the next thing I know, the fight's getting stopped. The standard for chokes in mixed martial arts is to let it go until the fighter taps or goes unconscious so that there are no questions as to who won. But by not following this standard, Yamasaki halted Kiesa's three-fight win streak that was inching him closer to a title shot. I mean, that guy is too focused on being some kind of playboy in front of the camera who's making his little heart logos. Maybe he should go back and read the f***ing rule book. But that stoppage would pale in comparison to Yamasaki's final and most infamous blunder. On February 3rd, 2018, Valentina Shevchenko made her flyweight debut opposite Priscilla Cachueta. And it's safe to say that this fight was a one-sided beatdown, where for the entirety of the fight, Shevchenko rained down ferocious ground and pound onto Cachueta. And through round two, it got progressively worse, with Priscilla getting bloodied, battered, crucified, and mounted by Shevchenko. And now in four bounds, the back. The back. Shevchenko stinks, man. And Mario Yamasaki just stood by as Casueta absorbed 230 strikes and only returned three strikes of her own. Valentina, clearly looking for the finish, realized Mario wasn't going to stop the fight via ground and pound, so she locked up a rear naked choke to win the fight via submission. Where it comes to Mario, he 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 made a, he made a mistake, and his mistake was he made a statement, saying he wanted Priscilla Cachueta to be a warrior, and UFC President Dana White was having none of that. I think it's disgusting. I think he's disgusting, and I never want to see him ref and ever again. You're in there to protect her from herself. He he makes me sick. That guy has no business refing fights, and and I promise you. You're not going to see him again. And so it was that iconic Be a Warrior comment got Yamasaki banned from ever refing UFC fights again. Afterward, he refed a couple of events for the PFL and has most recently refed a handful of events for MMA Brazil Tour. But seeing as it's clear that Yamasaki's career is mostly over, does he deserve the labels he's received? As recently as January 2023, Yamasaki did an interview with Talkin' MMA where he outlines that a few bad assignments doesn't make him a bad referee. You know, I, I referee 800 fights, and I f up in four. The only thing that shows on my, my history is four of the f that I did, because yeah. those are the ones that keep pushing, pushing, pushing. You know, what Dana said about me, oh, you're not going to step in the octagon again, blah, blah, blah. Those things are the ones that shows most, not my 798 fights that I did, you know, right. They don't care. They care what about what you did wrong. I think Dana was a little, you know, too rush on me because I'm not that bad, you know. And as for that iconic be a warrior comment, Yamasaki says that it wasn't even his fault. I had a, a, a public relation back then and they told me to say that and I said it as, you know, to let her be a warrior and blah, blah, blah. And that became the, the focus point on him. And to be fair to Mario, he's owned up to many of his errors. For Eric Silva's disqualification, he said to err is human and it is no shame to admit that you made a mistake. For the Travis Brown fight, he said there is no excuse, I know I should have stopped it earlier. For the Chiesa fight, Mario said that Chiesa was within his right to appeal the outcome of the fight. For the Cachueta fight, he said I think I really could have stopped it earlier, it was a mistake. And I know that acknowledging his mistakes doesn't undo what he did. 
poor stoppages and bad referee calls can halt a fighter's momentum, derail the trajectory of a fighter's career, ruin their earning potential, and increase the risk of injuries and long-term health complications. But to be fair to him, lots of respected referees have made mistakes as well. Everybody's gonna make a mistake, you know, you there. So Herb made a mistake, John made a mistake, I made a mistake. And it's true, in recent years, Herb Dean's had a few unfortunate assignments. The Trinaldo fight and Connor's illegal knees to Khabib, to name a few. And even our legendary Big John McCarthy has made mistakes, such as his awful stoppage of Kazushi Sakuraba versus Conan Silvera. These mistakes don't define these referees, but Mario's mistakes stick to him like a disease. Perhaps it's because the magnitude of each mistake got progressively worse. Or maybe it's because the long break between bad calls makes it feel like it's been a decade of awful decisions. And you can't deny that Dana White's overwhelming personality has led the narrative against Mario. The real question we have to ask ourselves as fans is, do 9 bad nights out of hundreds make him the worst or most incompetent or most hated referee ever? Or is there another referee who more rightfully deserves that mantle? Because he just might, and I just might make a video about him. So make sure to like, subscribe, and comment something hilarious down below, because I have way more stories to tell.